All right, so I want all of you to meet my dear friend, April Anderson. And April, can you take a minute and just tell them a little bit about yourself? I know um, you are right outside DC, but you travel to three different areas and you're <laughs> licensed in all three areas. Tell us a little bit more about that. Thanks, Mel. Um, I am originally from Louisiana and I graduated from Louisiana State University, go Tigers. Um, I have been in the DC area for a little over six years. Um, and as Mel said, I have a license and I work and see children um, in the District of Columbia, but at also Maryland and Virginia. Um, and so I was fortunate enough that a lot of my schooling um, through grad school was really heavy on feeding therapy. Um, and then as Mel said, I met her a um, few years ago and she was doing really great things and uh, kind of really jumped in um, with feeding therapy. I'm also a certified lactation counselor. Um, and so I do a lot of work with the breastfeeding centers here in DC um, and with moms in and out of early intervention who may be having trouble um, breastfeeding um, as it relates to a speech therapist and tongue ties and um, sucking and swallowing and that whole shebang. <laughs> Well, that's awesome. You're driving all over the place to help these children. I am. I am. Um, spend a lot of time in my car. DC traffic is not some of the best. Um, <laughs> but with these little guys, um, it's really hard to get a mom to come out of her house. You know, she needs the help at home. And a lot of times that's where the problems are happening um, at home, at daycare, at grandma's house. Um, I do see a couple of kids in my office. Um, I currently work for National Therapy Center. Um, and we have offices in Maryland as well as in DC, but the majority of my work is done in the homes with the parents and the family. That's awesome. And I know part of that is what we call the coaching model. And for parents who are listening and professionals who may not be familiar with that, can you just give them a short, um, brief understanding of what the coaching model is in early intervention? Sure. So when we look at the coaching model, we look at exactly what it sounds like. Um, the therapist comes in and she is the coach um, and the parent or caregiver or daycare provider is the coachy. And so it's a lot of role reversal than what you think of your typical therapy of I'm going to bring my child to therapy and the therapist is going to help me um, by showing me these things. Whereas in the coaching model, it's really a team effect and the therapist is coaching the parent to be able to implement the strategies when the therapist isn't there because especially with feeding, as we know, kids don't just eat one time a day, once a week when it's time for therapy. You know, there are so many opportunities and so many meals that happen when the therapist is not there. And so with the coaching model, it kind of builds the capacity for the parents and the caregivers to be able to implement these strategies outside of therapy. Um, and in turn, the children make more progress and they make quicker progress. And the parents are really able to be a part of that therapeutic process. You know, a few weeks ago, and it's on my YouTube channel as well, I had Carrie Ebert, who's also a specialist from birth to five, does a lot of early intervention. And I follow her on Instagram, and she had this beautiful picture the other day of this big bowl of one color of M&Ms. I think they were just like all the pink M&Ms. And then she had one blue M&M in the bowl. And her point was, the blue M&M is the therapist. All the pink M&Ms are the parents, the grandparents, the daycare, every, all of those uh, um, uh, adults, and actually some of the, the siblings as well, have the opportunity to help these kids 100 times more than we do during our one session a week. And I think you really, you really have captured that with the coaching model. It's really up to them. It's up to us to coach them through it but they really are the most important piece. So that brings me to your very first tip and you call it the MVP. Can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. So when we look at a coach, a coach is the one that's leading the team, but the most important players on that team that's coming um, and making the family go to victory is the MVP. And I say the MVP is whoever the primary caregiver is. So that's the parent, um, that's the grandparent. The child spends a lot of time at daycare. Sometimes that's the daycare provider as well. Um, and so the MVP is almost as important or more important than the coach because the coach can have all these great strategies and this great game plan. But if the MVP isn't carrying out the game plan, then we're kind of back to square one. 
and the whole team needs to rally together in order to make progress and win the, win the games and eventually get that final trophy at the end of the season. And I think of that final trophy as, you know, just those, those ultimate goals that we have for the kiddo before discharge. And it really is up to each member of the team. That's why really I, I appreciate your analogy of the coaching model and the MVP. It's such a good one. And your second tip for us was a little surprising to me when you you told me earlier today, you said, you know, Melanie, I don't always focus on the table time as much as I do the rest of the time with the child. And tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, so with early intervention, we think about meal times and meal times usually happen between 11 and 12 30 um there's only five days a week and i have a lot of kids and so not everyone gets seen during that typical breakfast lunch dinner meal time and so it's really important to be able to implement strategies outside of that structured sitting at the dinner table the food's ready to go um and a lot of times it's because especially when you're looking at some of these older children in early intervention so your two-year-olds and you know your three-year-olds they may have some negative feelings already about that dinner table. And so when I come in as an early intervention therapist, I may be seeing this child for feeding, but I may also be seeing this child for language with some feeding goals. And so it's important to be able as part as the coach of this team to bring the child kind of outside of that stressful environment and be able to implement strategies during playtime or even I love getting out of the house. So even sitting on the front porch, sitting on the trampoline, going to McDonald's, going to the zoo, you know, just to reprogram and repair the relationship, not only with the food, but repair the relationship with the parent, our MVP, with the child um, and the family. So that then when we're talking about implementing some of these strategies um, and playing with a little push and pull, it's much better on the child because it's not such a stressful environment that they may have, you know, negative memories from. That's right. That's right. And I don't know if you remember me um, talking about this when you were taking my course years ago, but I always talk about the fact that we all have a filing cabinet in our brain and it's filled with food experiences. And probably for you and I, April, because I know you love food the way I do, it's pretty positive. But for our clients, especially our kids with autism, for example, or just really restrictive eaters, their filing cabinet only has a few files of positive experiences, and they're just with those highly preferred foods. And sometimes that positive experience can just be the fact that it filled their belly. Sometimes those kids don't even enjoy food that much, but it, it satisfied the hunger, and that's the only memory they have filed there. But you and I, and you just expressed it so beautifully, our role is to create a whole new file drawer of brand new positive experiences around food. And one of the first ways we can do that is to make sure that we're, what I say, getting to the yes. In other words, getting the kid to be like, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I want to do that. And you can't always start at the table. You can't always start with taking a bite. Sometimes it's, we're going to go to the park. And we're going to take these oranges and roll them down the slide, you know, and they're like, yeah, I want to roll the oranges down the slide. And slowly over time, we're making friends with oranges. Then we learn to peel them and eventually we learn to smell them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until we, we ride that yes wave until it's time to take a bite. And of course, part of that, too, is just knowing whether or not the kid has the motor skills to be able to take that bite whether they have medical issues that might be getting in the way, all this time have been in the way. You and I really have to be food detectives. But your, your third tip that I thought was so interesting and honestly surprised me when you mentioned it to me is as much as we want to be a therapist, we sometimes have to be careful not to be a therapist. <laughs> so can you explain that to everybody listening, please? It was such a good tip. Absolutely. So... Um, when we think about therapy or we think about going to the doctor or um, going to the dentist, we're going and seeing these professionals or these professionals are coming into our home and they are the expert and they're the ones who know what to do. Um, and so sometimes when we're being the therapist with these families, they are deferring all of the knowledge to us when they have important tidbits um, about this child, but then also their culture and their life and their routine 
may look different than how we learned it from a course or read it in a book. And so when we're talking about these materials that are great for kids or you know, using a certain spoon or fork, we have to understand that sometimes that doesn't fit into what the family is doing. And so taking off that therapist hat and becoming a member almost of their family and saying, okay, how does this family operate? This cup would be really great, but this doesn't really fit in the scheme of what the family is doing. And so how can I be a detective, but also be an artist and you know be creative and how can I make work what the family already has in the home, which is such a big part of early intervention. We talked about it earlier um, here in DC, Virginia and Maryland, you know, the therapists no longer bring these big duffel bags into the sessions right. with all the fancy toys and materials. And I think that's great because if I bring this fancy bowl in and I get this kid to eat the oranges out of this fancy bowl, the fancy bowl is gonna leave with me. And now that puts pressure on the family to have to replicate what I did versus if I go and get grandma's Tupperware out and we put stickers on that Tupperware, now that's something that the family has, but then the family and that the MVP feel like, hey, all the tools I needed were already here in the home. I just needed the therapist to come and show me how to do them versus the reason why my kid didn't eat oranges for a year is because I didn't bring that sparkly blue bowl you know, that the therapist brought in. <laughs> Well, I, I think you bring up a great point. And definitely we have families who um, they they can go out and get the sparkly bowl. But we have other families that maybe financially it's just not possible or they're just busy, you know, especially with two parents working outside the home. And I, I think the most important thing is if we're going to just spend that little bit of time with the child, that really we want to provide opportunities throughout the week where it's more typical of their daily living style in terms of what toys they might grab for their, their kiddo. And um, to bring, just bring back Carrie Ebert's uh, example, when I had her on a few weeks ago, she brought up five different toys that are, we could use in feeding therapy that we can find in almost anybody's home. And, you know, one that I love is just a salad spitter. Most people have a salad spitter nowadays. And if not, they're very, very inexpensive. And I can certainly bring one over and just leave it with the family that you can get them at the dollar store. And they, you can put almost anything in there and pump away at it. And you can use it for speech and language as well. And it's just always fun. I mean, every little kid I work with loves to just pump <laughs> on that thing and watch it spin and then open it up and see what happened to whatever was spinning around in there. And you can, you can have some pretty fun things happen with a lot of different foods in a salad spinner and then wash it out afterwards. So I, I agree with you 100% in that as much as I really love the toys that I use to build skills, part of what I do too is helping parents understand what they already have in the home that can reinforce what we're learning in therapy because ultimately it comes down to them being the MVP, as you said earlier. Well, gosh, can you think of anything else before we start taking some questions? Or are you ready to, to have a few questions come your way? Um, I'll just say that, you know, these children, um, when we're dealing with kids who are picky eating um, or kids who are refusing foods or, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, they're irrational. And a lot of times their fears <laughs> of food may not make sense to us. You know, I always say, um, those who can't do teach, you know, I was that child that never ate condiments. I can't tell you why I didn't eat them. I just know I was afraid of them. Um, yeah. and so I think starting off having that baseline understanding of it doesn't make sense that he's afraid of the oranges, but let's figure out how to get past that versus coming in with the mindset of it's just an orange. Um, cause to a lot of kids, just an orange is a big deal. Um, so I, I a lot of times I find in early intervention, sometimes just even getting the family to understand that I understand it's irrational, but let's figure out how to work through this versus thinking in the mode of it's just an orange. Take just a bite. I, I really appreciate that you're bringing that up. And I realize you're going to bring up that point because it ties right in to what I'll be speaking about on Thursday at the American Speech Language Hearing Association's conference. Um, and it's all about anxiety and picky eating. So we'll be doing a two hour seminar on that so that we can really help therapists understand the, the role that a child's anxiety plays 
and helping them make a decision about whether or not to try a food. But not only that, the role that the parents' anxiety mm -hmm. plays, because in their mind, they're like, why don't you just eat it? Because as you said, they just don't understand what that child is actually feeling and how important it is that we recognize the fact that the fear is often the biggest obstacle.